Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is LaShawn Drew. Um, I, I, I can move, right? You can move. Okay. Just gotta let me know if you're moving because I gotta move the camera. Okay. All right. I'm gonna stay right here. No, 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 I can move the camera. Um, so, um, as Eric alluded, I have a bunch of different things going on, so I'll get into that in a second. But how does somebody who used to assist those that were deceased move? to be able to give life to other people. How do you do that, right? In 1997, I graduated from high school. In 1999, I was a parent, all right? Um, I had a full ride scholarship to college. I was going to ODU, I was gonna be a doctor, I was already working at a medical school on those that had passed. So I had it all laid out. And then in 99, I had a child. And I had to give up my full ride scholarship. There was no more college, right? Because now at that moment in time, I had a child that I had to take care of with no help. I'm not even 20 yet, no help, right? My parents were not in the capacity of their space to be able to help me. My mom, you, know, you learn a lot about your parents when you get older. Right? When we're young, we have no idea what our parents are going through because if anybody's household was like mine, you don't talk about nothing. Right? You talk about absolutely nothing at all. So I didn't even know my parents until I felt like I was like 30. Right? So I didn't have the help. My father, who was my guy, that was like my, my guy, he was in the military, and he told me I would never be anything because he was West Indian. West Indian culture, you don't do that. You don't have kids out of white box. You're supposed to be married. He told me I wasn't going to be anything. My mom's Spanish. She grew up very, very tough. She wasn't in the capacity to help me. So now I'm on my own. Don't have a college scholarship. I was living on campus. Don't have anywhere to live for real. What do I do? Right? So I go out there and I work very, very hard. Right? I didn't know at the time exactly what I wanted to do, where I wanted to be, how I wanted to do it, but I knew that I did not want to be a statistic. Because the young ladies that I was graduating school with, by that time, some of them had already had their third kid. I didn't want to do that. So I said, what do I do? I worked temp agencies. I did everything you can think of legally, all right? <laughs> everything you can think of legally to make a dollar. So that way I can make sure that I can take care of my son and that way I can take care of myself. So then you fast forward, and I started waitressing. Because I said, man, I get money real quick. I'm good with people. I can get some money. And I made great money waitressing, right? And then decided I'm going to management. Went to management, did all that, right? Then I went to corporate America. Now, when I went to corporate America, nobody, they did not know that I did not have my college degree. They assumed I had my college degree because I had to speak. I had to carry myself. You didn't ask me, I wasn't gonna tell you, <laughs> right? So I worked my way up that ladder and started getting seats at the table. And we all know what that means. But when I got a seat at that table, they were trying to check the affirmative action box to say, hey, we're gonna put a black girl at this table. But you better not say nothing. You can sit there, but don't talk. They picked the wrong one, <laughs> all right? They picked the wrong one. So when I sat at that table, oh, you heard what I had to say. Because one of the things that we talked about, and as he mentioned, Raphael, diversity, it's more than just color. It's more than just being a woman or a man or whatever the case is, it's thoughts. And the company that I work for, which I will not disclose, the company that I work for had been around for a very, very long time. And all of the people that worked, the majority of the people that were sitting at that table were, if they wore anything other than a blue tie, they, they, they were just, uh, they, they were rebels, right? So me coming to the table being who I am was completely outside the box. And I made it known that we need to be heard in whatever form that we're in. Now at the time I didn't have my businesses because I thought that with this corporate job that I had, I was making a difference. And I was, 
I was in some ways, because I'm very community-based. I've always given back to the community. So even in that space, I brought the company along to where we could still continue to give back to the community. But it wasn't my company. And because it wasn't my company, I didn't have the say-so that I would have liked to have. So at the height of the pandemic, y'all hear me, the height of the pandemic, when other people are running away from opening a business, here I go, I'm running to a business. And I opened the worst business you could open up in a pandemic. A restaurant, <laughs> right? A restaurant. We could have no dining. Nobody could sit down. They hardly could come into the building. Why would I open a restaurant in the pandemic? Because the one thing that I always knew is that food brings people together. Always brings people together. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I didn't know how we were going to get through it. But I had said earlier in the year, we're opening this restaurant. And guess what? That's exactly what we did. We were packed. It was all to go, but we were packed. And then like any good business, the, it, it dies down. It dies down. The, the, the fun dies down. The excitement it dies down. And that's when the real work starts. When everybody's excited about it, it's great. You're packed. Oh, this is amazing. We're going to make all this money. And then guess what? The excitement goes away. And the news comes up, and it says something new today and something new tomorrow. And now we're sitting there, and we made $100. It's like, oh, boy. <laughs> what are we going to do now? So we failed a lot. I'm thankful that I failed a lot. Because in failing, I fell forward. And it helped me be able to understand, you know what, we took a chance. And that chance that we took maybe didn't pan out great that time, but we learned what not to do so that way the next time. Not only did it pan out great, it was amazing. And along the way, we brought others along with us. I'm a huge component. You don't do this alone. You got to be able to reach back and bring somebody along with you. Now, if they want to be kicking and screaming, they might have to stay there for a little bit because we don't got time for all that. But if you want to come along, I'm going to help you along. So we opened the original hot dog factory. I kept my corporate job during that time because I wanted to make sure every single one of my employees got paid. I paid them through my corporate job. I never laid anybody off. And then one day, my corporate job had a promotion. I said, oh, I'm going to go for that promotion because I know I'm super qualified for that, right? Super, super qualified. And I was. They passed on me and gave it to three men. Sorry, guys. They gave it to three men and none of them were of color. So you know what I did? I said, I'm giving y'all a month notice. Because I know my value. I know my worth. I know what I've done to this company for the last 16 to 17 years. And I refuse to give you any more of my time when I can devote that in places where we're really truly going to be able to impact people. I left that company. Now, there's something to be said when you don't get a paycheck on Friday. <laughs> something to be said when you don't have insurance anymore. These are all things that as entrepreneurs and business owners, we go through. But I refuse to stay in a place that I knew that I was not going to be able to impact in the way that I knew God gave me the gift to impact. And I left that company and I never looked back. Now, in the process of that, because I had been working with the youth for many, many years, I started staying the course. And staying the course is a 501c3. And it is geared towards young women between the ages of 10 to 18. And it's to help them navigate through life, because I was one at one point. I needed guidance. And I know that people prayed for me, prayed over me, prayed to me. How could I not do that for other people? So we do mentorship, right? We, 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 we help the families because you gotta be able to help the families sometimes to be able to help the youth, right? Don't give up on our youth. They need us. They need us more than they know. I have a teenage daughter, she's 18. She's the one that I say is my challenge. She teaches me and she, she really pulls out my gangster like every day, right? <laughs> every day she pulls it out. I gotta figure out new ways, right? But she helps me understand the climate of the children that we have right now and the support and help that they need. I live in South Jersey. I have an office in Philly. 
There's so much gun violence and things that are going on right now. We gotta make sure that we're there for our children. Let's help them in any way that we can. We started staying the course, right? The logo is a windy road, because life ain't straight. It's a windy road. It's got a pothole, because sometimes you're gonna fall in that hole. It's got a hurdle, because sometimes you gotta jump over some hurdles. And it's got a speed bump, because sometimes you gotta slow the hell down. That's the logo for that particular reason. That's life. And then at the very end, you're still gonna get there because you don't ever let people tell you what your dream is. You don't let them like, stop you when it comes to your dream. They may not understand what you're trying to do. And sometimes people speak out of fear. And it's their own fear. It's nothing against you. It's their own fear because they haven't yet figured out how can you do that? And it's okay. I'm gonna still love you. Just from a little from, from afar, right? Because at the end of the day, when you have been given a gift, I don't care what your gift is, when you've been given a gift, you better move in that direction with that gift. Because when we all get to the end of whatever our lives are, look back and make sure that you were using the gift that you were given. Your gift is different than your gift. Your gift is different than your gift. I am my own competition. I don't compete with anybody. You all don't compete with anybody. Because we are all out here together to make this thing work and to make this thing happen. And at the very end of all of this, the young man that I left college for, the young man that I sacrificed for, is sitting right there. That young man right there is 24 years old. He is a part owner of the original hot dog factory in 40s. He is learning the business from the ground up. I told him, before you can have a business, you better learn how to sweep that floor. You better learn how to wash that counter. You better learn how to speak to people with the respect that they deserve. Because I don't care what job it is that we have somebody in our business do, you ain't that far from it. So this young man right here, at some point, will have that location to himself, and I know that he's gonna do amazing things because he's learned how to do it. Girl with a grill, and that's what I'll end with. One day I had a dream. I had a dream, and I said, I want to feed people. My fiance said, you do that every day. I said, I know, but I want to do it differently. Girl with a grill, we show up to people that are in need, or those that are in need, unannounced, and we feed them for free. They have no idea we're coming. I literally pull out grills, and we cook on the spot, and we give them hot, fresh food. I feed them the same food that I feed in a restaurant. Because just because you can't afford to pay for it, doesn't mean you don't deserve it. So every single person to date, we have fed 7,000 people. 7,000 people. And the funny story about that is, most of that's been out of pocket. We're working on grants. We're working on getting some money. We've had some wonderful people that have blessed us along the way and say, here, Take some money because I want to sponsor your next one. Majority of that has been out of pocket. Because when you have a dream, remember I said nobody stopped you from your dream. I don't worry about where the money's going to come from. I don't ever worry about where the money's going to come from. Because somehow it comes. It may come at the 11th hour, but somehow it comes. And when I get out there and we, and we go places people don't want to go. We were in Kensington for Thanksgiving. We fed a thousand people in Kensington. And when we feed you, we serve you. Because I may be, I may be where you're at one time. Maybe I was already there, right? You have, there's a humbleness that we must have when we're giving back to others. So when you come to me, how can we help you? How can we serve you? What can we do for you today? And it goes a long way. I had a guy that wrote me a poem, he was a poet. We were out in the art museum, so we're feeding. And he came to me, he wrote me a poem, and he said that oftentimes we're mad at God because we're in this position. I used to be, I used to be just like you. This is what he says, I used to be just like you, and I still have the poem because he wrote it. And he said, today you gave us hope that somebody actually cares enough to treat us like the human beings we are. And I told him, I said, you didn't used to be like me, you still are. You might be in different positions right now, but you still are. Thank you for the gift that you gave me. 
That gift didn't cost him nothing. It didn't cost me nothing. When you give back to others, you got to give in a way that you don't expect anything in return. So with that being said, thank you. I appreciate you all. Continue to stay the course.